All right, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Julio Porro, and I'm medical director of Central California Alliance for Health. And I'd like to thank you for coming here this evening and welcome you all to our program tonight on the social determinants of health. As you perhaps notice, we're trying a little high tech type growth um, act tonight. So we have a webinar portion, we have three remote panelists. We have live attendees, and um, this program is going to be coming during CME, so other people will be able to uh, look at this and receive CME for about a year, until November of 2019. So my part here is really, again, to welcome you from the Alliance's perspective. Um, the Alliance uh, recognizes the importance and value of addressing social determinants of health to truly impact our members' care. As many of you know, the Alliance's Medi-Cal Capacity Grant Program has set aside $75 million, and we have um, um, given out about $43 million. And again, it's to support community groups and programs that serve our Medi-Cal members. Now, I'd like to introduce our physician consultant for the Health Improvement Partnership, Dr. Jen Hastings. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. I introduced myself to a few of you and I'm thank, just thank you for coming. I think this is a critical issue for all of us providing health care currently. I think it's actually always been a current, but you know, a critical issue, but it's wonderful that we have fantastic speakers this evening to help guide us through these complex issues and how to actually do this when we're providing health care. So, the first thing I'd like to do is talk about the Health Improvement Partnership. So the next slide, please. We are Health Improvement Partnership is a coalition of healthcare and nonprofit philanthropists in uh, organizations in Santa Cruz County that work together to improve healthcare for our community. And we're guided by the triple aim and the quadruple aim uh, that the health the Institute of Healthcare Improvement has laid out. And this slide talks a little bit about what we do, a neutral table or a platform where people can come together. Trust and transparency are obviously critical. And we bring leaders together to look at issues that impact our community. And we want to seek out and bring transformative ideas to all of you. And we work with Central California Alliance for Health to bring continuing medical education that is inspiring and relevant and can help improve healthcare for all. So the next slide, I think. So tonight we're going to be, um, as Julio mentioned, having several different kinds of presentations. The first is a recording of Dr. Laura Gottlieb, who's at uh, UCSF and is the director of an organization that she actually created called SIREN, which is Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network. You can go online and Google UCSF SIREN and you'll find a very impressive website with research and writings and practical things that uh, address the issue of social determinants of health. So we'll have her for about 35 minutes doing a presentation she did a couple of weeks ago uh, in San Francisco County, Watsonville. And then we'll have three live panelists with us live from their places of where they do their work. We have Joni Rothstein, who's um, at the San Francisco General, and we can see Joni on the right there and Managing Director of two amazing programs in San Francisco. And then Jared garrison Jackal, who's in, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, Jared. Um, is it Jackal? Okay, I got it close. Um, at the homeless, and he's the Homeless Services Clinical Director for West County Health Centers in, I believe, in Gerzo. And then we have Wendy Vieira, who is the Director of Operations uh, in Santa Cruz County working with some very interesting FQHCs and clinics. So it's a jam-packed um, evening. I want to uh, have the people who are on doing the this program from home and those of you who are in the audience today and those of you who are listening in the future to look at the packet. That you'll have a virtual packet if you're on, online. So for those of you who are seeking continuing education credit, whether that be as a physician, physician assistant, or nurse practitioner, um, and for those of you who are in other capacities, RNs, uh, LMFT, uh, 
and social workers. What was that? LCSWs. LCSWs, and those of you who are um, doing alcohol counseling and addiction counseling, all of you, we would like you to fill out this green CME form. This suffices for those of you getting medical credit, and then those of you who have different kinds of licenses can get your credit, and it's color-coded for those of you who have it in the room here, and you've got a PDF with different names if you're getting this from home or on your home computer. And for those of you who are virtual, we want you to please send your license and email and your CME form to admin at HIPFCC, that's HIPFCC.org, so that you, we can give you your credit. And I think we're almost ready to, we can queue up Dr. Gottlieb. For those of you who are in the audience, live and virtual, Please hold your questions, but we really want your questions because our panelists are here listening. And so write them down and at, when we finish all of the presentation, which should end in about an hour, we really welcome your questions and look forward to conversation about how we make this happen in our health centers. Thanks so much. Good evening, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. Um, and I'm excited that this is the focus of this evening's conversation. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about me, and then I'm going to start with a little bit of a confession. So let's just go here. So um, I'm on faculty in the Department of Family and Community Medicine, as Holly mentioned. I also direct an initiative called the Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network, or SIREN, which is a research acceleration and translation institute focused squarely on this topic, so focused directly on the integration of social and medical care and um, ways that we can advance the science in this area. Um, but now I'm just gonna get to my confession. So the physician in this picture is essentially me ignoring the social and economic underlying factors that cause disease. And I guess I would ask how many people in the room have ever felt like they were this person? Raise your hands. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty much, it's hard to talk with a safety net audience and not have everybody raise their hands. So everywhere I have practiced, I have felt like the tools in my toolbox weren't quite the right ones for treating the low-income patients that I was seeing in clinic. I needed jobs and I needed food, not so much insulin and antidepressants, but those were the tools in my toolbox. And everywhere I went, I was told that wasn't medicine, until recently, when medicine started changing. For all the, you know, with all the great examples, actually, Dale, that you started with, medicine didn't always used to do that. And in the last decade, we've seen this enormous interest in social determinants. And I think it's helpful to just take a step back and to think about why that's happening. So it's no secret, uh, certainly to anybody in this room, that the US health outcomes don't look so hot in comparison to other OECD countries. Especially if you look at how much we're paying per capita for those outcomes. So this graph shows life expectancy on the y-axis as a function of health expenditures per capita. And this is just for OECD countries. And it shows how the association between life expectancy and health expenditures have changed over time. So starting in about the 1980s, the US started paying more per capita than other countries, but not getting the health returns that we all expected for the 17% of our GDP that we were spending on healthcare. And as a result, over the last decade or so, as we started to see these things come in, we've developed more motivation to explore some more innovative models for delivering care. Now, some people, like Betsy Bradley when she was at Yale, have suggested that those very poor health outcomes are related to the fact that as a country, we spend disproportionately more on health care than we do on social care, like housing, food, social security, than they do in OECD, other OECD countries. So in this chart, you can see that while we're not an outlier when it comes to total spending, total expenditures, if you put medical and social care expenditures together, so the total height of each one of these bars, we, in fact, we're actually in the middle, 
in terms of total expenditures we are definitely an outlier when you look at the ratio between social and medical care expenditures we spend more on medical care and less on social care and other countries spend more on social care and less on medical care so if i were going to be really provocative in front of this health care medical care audience i would say that increased medical spending is actually a threat to health and in fact our low social services spending as a nation belies the fact that we are increasingly aware that socioeconomic factors like poverty and the health behaviors that are a result of poverty contribute more to premature mortality than medical care. I'm hoping that we can all agree that poverty is an independent risk factor for mortality. In fact, men in the lowest income bracket will die 15 years earlier than men in the highest income bracket. So, when you put all that together, I like to think that combined, the awareness that social determinants matter and that our relatively poor health outcomes are a result of lower social spending, when you put all that together, that's what's leading a growing number of healthcare systems um, like Kaiser and Geisinger and ProMedica of payers like the Alliance and many other medical, me, state Medicaid agencies and Medicaid managed care organizations and all of these national professional organizations including our primary care uh, associations, uh, the AAFP, the AAP, to start talking about how are we as a healthcare system going to make up for that gap in social services spending in some small way, at least as one part of a comprehensive strategy to improve health. This is in no way a comprehensive list of the organizations around the country who are working in this area. Okay, that's all the big picture that I'm going to do. And now I'm going to do a little bit more focused on just what's happening in the healthcare system uh, to address social determinants of health, because there's a lot. So before going into the use cases, though, I'm going to... I do want to just acknowledge that there are there is a lot that healthcare organizations are doing outside of the clinical delivery system. So a lot of healthcare organizations are investing in housing, are um, uh, doing tons of community benefit activities that are not necessarily based on the patient populations that they're serving. But tonight's talk is going to focus less on living wage practices, green purchasing, all of those those kind of bigger picture. Um, community health activities that people are doing as anchor institutions um, and more on the clinical delivery system, which I hope will be most relevant to people in this room. So let's talk about the use cases that we're seeing at the clinical delivery system level. So I generally put these use cases into three buckets and then there are some subdivisions. So I'm going to just run through them um, to kind of make sure we're all on the same page. So health systems, we've seen health systems using social determinants data for direct patient care purposes, for population health purposes, and that is mostly I'm going to talk about population health management, so the population served by the health system. And then uh, related to those but warranting a category all to themselves are the payment and risk adjust, uh, adjustment uses. So at the patient care level, would having social determinants of health data help to improve care? I divide this bucket into two big categories. And I, I, uh, I'm hoping that this will be some of the focus of the conversation that we have af at, during the panel. So one of the categories I refer to as social determinants or social needs informed care. So this is work that we do every day in the safety net, but not always well or systematically. We accommodate social factors that could interfere with medical treatment. We try to improve access to care for patients who don't have great access. We send out mobile vans. We offer evening and weekend clinics. Um, we provide interpreters to people who don't speak English. We also use social determinants data to inform diagnostics. So for instance, the mini mental status is adjusted for literacy level, the GFR is adjusted for race, 
And finally, we change our treatment plans based on social determinants. We dose once daily meds to accommodate complicated work schedules. We choose medications that don't have to be refrigerated. We don't prescribe diuretics to patients who don't have access to bathrooms during the day. Maybe we don't prescribe CPAPs to patients who live in shelters. But the problem is that we don't do those things for every patient, every time. We rely on our provider intuition, maybe it's marked in the chart, but we've never tied a ribbon around all of those interventions, protocolized them, studied them. In general, we do social determinants informed care inconsistently and haphazardly. Ensuring that these kinds of interventions are routinely part of our clinical algorithms requires having social determinants of health data at our fingertips and then knowing what to do with them. Another increasingly popular way, and I think you've probably heard a lot more about these kinds of interventions, that we're using social determinants data to improve care patient care is what I call social determinants targeted care. And this is where the social factor is actually the target. So patients who don't have food, we give them food boxes. Dale mentioned the one where we're patients who are going just being discharged from the hospital. We're giving, making sure that they have access to food in the days following a hospitalization. Instead of using non-refrigerated medications, which would be social needs informed care, we might help them get a refrigerator, um, as an example. At Roots Community Health Center in Oakland, they're helping people get living wage jobs. Uh, we pay for housing support specialists right now using some of the waiver dollars in California. We connect patients with free diaper and parenting programs like we're doing at San Francisco General, and, and Joni will talk about that. But again, all of these interventions are sometimes part of care, but not routinely. In places where they are providing social determinants of health targeted care, in general, patients are being screened for one or more social determinants using a social screening tool of some sort. And we'll talk a little bit more about the screening tools and how people are selecting them in a few moments. And then that screening is often followed by a question about, well, do you want help with this? That second question about desire for help has actually made screening much more feasible in many places, especially in safety net settings. So if you work in a place where 95% of your patients are gonna answer yes to a question about food insecurity, it can be a little intimidating to, to start a routine or systematic screening program. But in the places where they've, do it, where they've done this and they've studied it, it turns out that only about 15 to 20% of the patients who actually have a food insecurity, or report food insecurity, as one example, actually desire help with that from their healthcare delivery system. So there's more research that we need to, we need to do to figure out why people don't want help or where else they're getting help or is it because of the provider-patient relationship, what's going on there but it has made this work much more feasible in the safety net settings where they're doing the screening work. The screening questions generally are followed by uh, providers making relevant referrals to internal or external resources. And this is where we've seen the social workers, community health workers, the navigators, the students that Joni will talk about, the financial counselors, tax prep advisors come in. Sometimes these team members provide social services on site food boxes, financial services, legal supports, but oftentimes they're referring to outside community or government agencies. So I don't know about you guys, but when I was a medical student, there weren't 20 different companies offering to do that resource connecting for us. We only had social workers and sometimes social work students, but now, People are using health IT, these technology-based companies, are providing resource referral platforms um, like nobody's business. I mean, it's amazing how many companies have sprung up in this space. They're essentially selling healthcare systems information about social services resources in the community, sometimes in combination with a case management platform. 
So this slide is, again, just a partial list. But each of these agencies is marketing a service that they sell to providers or to payers that helps connect patients with community resources. How many of you work in a place that's using one of these platforms? So still only just a few of you, maybe five or six of you, but uh, these are taking on like wildfire. So we requested data from these vendors to learn more about the scale and spread of this work, and it was striking. So the, the number of patients served by one of these platforms grew by over, uh, I don't know how to say this in percentages, 33-fold in the last 10 years. So the four platforms alone that were willing to share data with us, they in, uh, in 2016 had seen, you know, had served 300,000 patients, and in the first quarter alone of 2018 had served twice as many. So the, the platforms are springing up. Epic is now getting into this. The, some of the platforms are available in the Epic Orchard, which is like their preferred vendors of people who have um, business associates licenses with them. So if you want to know if technology is playing a role in the social determinants of, space, social determinants of health space, you don't have to look any further. Later this fall, our team at Siren should have a report out about these technology vendors for people who are interested in learning more about the bells and whistles offered by the different platforms. But let's move on to some of the population health management uses of social determinants data. So these uses require that we aggregate our patient data at the level of the clinic, the health system, the county, or beyond to provide better care to select populations. And as just a couple of examples here, I've listed panel management and community health improvement. But as a, I, I love the example of Manitoba, where the province has started to use area level social determinants of health information to adjust panel sizes. The Veterans Administration does this too. So they adjust panel sizes for their, for their providers working in the homeless clinics. Um, so that those providers are not being judged uh, based on the number of visits that they see. Um, they're being judged more on the quality of the services that they provide. Um, another potential panel management use for social determinants data is to help target resources to specific populations. So for instance, if you knew all your highest utilizers were also homeless, you might bring in housing support specialists. But if we're not asking those questions routinely, we don't make those changes. So, these routinely collected social determinants data can also be used to, oops, yeah, uh, to inform activities directed to entire communities, not just to the patient population served. And I d this is a little bit different from the community benefit activities. And I want to just give this great example from Cincinnati Children's Hospital, where they aggregate addre address data from patients hospitalized with asthma from one health center and using that data, they identified a cluster of asthma cases from one big housing complex. The medical center then worked with a medical legal partnership team and the tenants association from that housing complex to advocate for building-wide repairs, which lowered asthma triggers for all the tenants, not just the tenants who were patients in the hospital. That was still aggregated patient level data that was being used to affect community level interventions. And again, as I've mentioned before, many health systems are also just engaging at the community level without it necessarily being based on patient level information, but I just love that example. So I wanna highlight one big unknown around the panel management use case which is that there's a major evidence gap on the population use case. And that's whether or not these social needs kind of interventions should be targeted specifically at the highest risk, highest utilizing patients, or to patients that are more in the rising risk category, where we may be able to prevent future illness or make, have a bigger bang for our buck. Sometimes the sickest populations are actually the hardest to the reduce, the reduce costs for. 
so as a result a lot of research is now being done on the return on investment of these kinds of interventions and how to target them to the population that will be most likely to benefit from them so as I mentioned earlier, I can't possibly talk about the use of the social determinants data without mentioning the payment and risk adjustment use cases that are emerging in this sector. So some state waiver programs, including our own here in California, um, have enabled Medicaid payments for housing support services for homeless patients, which is incredible. And in, in each of the states where this kind of work is happening, Providers are going to need to document homelessness status. How many of you actually document that now? Routinely. So, a handful, again. So in order to justify the need for the higher level of service, we're going to have to do that for all of our homeless patients. So recently I learned about a higher per member per month rate from Blue Cross Blue Shield that's being given to clinics that are regularly documenting the provision of enabling services, like transportation, financial counseling, and interpretation services. And then there's also certainly the interest in um, how state Medicaid agencies might include social risk factors into capitation payments, which they've done in Massachusetts. So they're now including homelessness status and neighborhood deprivation, neighborhood social deprivation scores into their capitation rates in order to provide higher um, reimbursement for, or higher, it's actually a capitation rate, so it's uh, a higher um, reimbursement, we'll put it in reimbursement terms, uh, for, for providers that are seeing more at-risk patients. And then finally, the National Quality Forum is, is now exploring ways that patient-level data could be used to adjust provider or plan scores on performance measures. And we've actually heard a, um, a, 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 a number of state Medicaid agencies that are talking about using quality incentive payments for providers that are screening for social needs, not just where social needs have been documented. So in Vermont and in Oregon, those are part of the quality um, incentive payment programs. So I mentioned, uh, actually, I mentioned the whole person care pilots, but we're actually neck deep in an alphabet soup of payment experiments uh, here in California, especially, but around the country, where people are trying these things out and nobody knows exactly what the, what the magic, what the special sauce is, exactly how social risk factors are gonna be incorporated into payment plans in the future. But it's coming down the pike. <laughs> So all of these uses, whether they're at the point of care or population health management or payment and risk adjustment uses, are going to require that those data about social risks are collected and accessible to the people who need them, whether it's providers and panel managers or payers and actuaries. So what do we need to think about when designing systems to collect social determinants data in clinical systems. So in their work for high, the High Tech Act, John Snow, which is a consult healthcare consulting company, suggested there are three considerations that we all need to think about as we try to build in data collection around social determinants. The first is systematic data collection. So right now, social determinants data are collected totally haphazardly in healthcare se settings. Maybe we think we know about a patient's neighborhood or food access, or maybe we ask some patients and we forget with others. But for both patient and population use cases, the data are gonna need to be collected more systematically, either universally or for specific populations, like maybe just Medicaid patients or maybe high utilizing populations or maybe just diabetic patients. So to increase systematic data collection, there's been a rapid growth in these social screening tools that I mentioned earlier. And they've been put forth by a variety of different organizations. But how would a health system choose between the 20 or so different social screening tools that are now in play? Some developed by the National Academy of Medicine, CMMI, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, or the National Association of Community Health Centers that's pushed hard on their PREPARE tool. 
so ultimately each health system is going to have to pick a screening tool that fits their use cases which is why i spend so much time on those different use cases as an example the measures used in the national academy of medicine tool some of which are listed here are strongly tied to health outcomes and some of them may be especially helpful in the risk adjustment use cases because they're so tied to health outcomes. But for the most part, healthcare providers, especially those working in safety net settings, don't know how to intervene on these topics. They may not feel like they're actionable or pragmatic, which is why the Accountable Health Communities demonstration, which was developed by CMMI, didn't pick those topics. They picked these topics housing, utilities, food, and transportation. It's a little bit less clear whether acting on these issues is going to lead to changes in health outcomes, but they feel more defined and more specific and more actionable by providers. So a lot of work remains to be done to better understand what social domains are meaningful in the healthcare delivery system and for which specific use cases. And then we need to think about how are we going to measure them, how are we going to measure their out outcomes, um, and of course, um, all of that is going to have to take into account the different populations that you're serving. So beyond systematic screening, we also need to think about how to capture these data in structured ways in our electronic health records, using EHR forms, not just in our notes. So when you go back later, you need to be able to count the number of patients that you have who are homeless or who are food insecure in order to direct resources to the right places. And it feels like a no-brainer, but it's so not common practice. And I'll just highlight one example from a geriatrics clinic in the UC system where they're systematically collecting information on IPV. Every patient who comes into this geriatric clinic gets asked a question about safety and interpersonal violence. And none of that information is ever collected and aggregated. It's done on a, page, on a paper form, and nobody ever goes back and counts that. So when I ask how many of the patients in your, cli in your clinics actually experience IPV and what resources do you have, nobody can give me an answer. So my main point here is put it in your electronic health record in a way that you can then go back and collate and aggregate that information. Epic, Cerner, NextGen, GeCentricity are all building platforms that are actually starting to structure social determinants data for you. So it used to be that Epic's social determinants or psycho psychosocial history was tobacco, alcohol, maybe sexual activity. And now in the 2018 Epic module, standard module, they're going to have a wheel that has food insecurity and housing stability and transportation and utilities. It's amazing. Um, Okay, so we talked a little bit about systematic data collection, structured data collection, and then I'm just going to say a couple things about what we call standardized social determinants data collection. So we've reached enough of a critical mass in this field that we're starting now to think about building tools for standardized data capture. So that's when payers start to require information about food insecurity or homelessness. We can all, on the back end of our EHRs, take the way you're screening about food insecurity and the way you're f screening for food insecurity and put it in a, I'm going to say a bad word, code. <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> it's still four letters. Okay, so um, uh, these are standardized medical vocabularies. If it do doesn't get coded, some, it, one, of, one, of the, um, one of my informatics partners told me, if it doesn't get coded, it never happened in the healthcare <laughs> delivery system. But that means that we need medical vocabularies that allow us to code for the great clinical activities that you may be doing around social determinants, even if we're doing slightly different things. But that last point about standardized informatics tools leads to another of the hot debates in the field right now. So it's kind of a chicken and an egg problem. It's not clear that we have the informatics infrastructure right now, that we have the codes that we need in order to do this work. Um, we need to be able to screen, say, or code for social screening, like did you screen for food security? Did you screen for homelessness? And then we need to code for what was the answer to that question? And then we need to code for, well, did you actually diagnose homelessness based on those answers? And then we need to be able to code for what would you do about it? 
um, and it doesn't have to be the providers. It can be anybody putting this information into the electronic health record. So we've been working with a national coalition of agencies to help define the coding standards in this field, and that includes LOINC codes and SNOMED codes and CPT codes, um, all of which are different medical vocabularies used in different parts of the healthcare delivery system, and without those codes, social determinants can't be used for the payment and quality uh, quality measurement issues that we, thank you, that we um, are seeing coming down the pike. Because what it does here is just show you all the different codes that are available for documenting the different food insecurity activities that may be relevant in your respective organizations. So I'm going to do a quick gear shift in the last few minutes that we have on this topic, and that is to just focus in a little bit on burnout. So. One of the things that we actually haven't done, uh, we haven't seen in the national literature in this area is what, is what is either doing something about social determinants or not doing something about social determinants, how does that affect us as providers in the safety net? And I will just put out this quick disclosure, which is I left clinical practice. I do a little bit still at San Francisco General, but I left clinical practice in large part because I felt, as I mentioned in that first slide, that I couldn't do enough about the upstream fundamental causes of disease, the reasons that patients were coming to see me in clinic at all. So it's not that providers don't know that this is important. And in fact, in a 2011 survey that was done by RWJF, four in five physicians surveyed say patient social needs are as important to address as their medical conditions. And I always think of this kind of like the Trident commercial. <laughs> like, who the heck is that fifth physician? Do you guys remember the Trident commercial where they're like, four out of five dentists recommend sugarless gum? <laughs> I'm like, really? Someone recommends sugar gum? Okay, whatever. So we ended up looking into this a little bit. So uh, we... We were wondering, so we got a lot of pushback from uh, healthcare providers saying, well, if I had to take this on, this would be a disaster. I would just leave. The electronic health record is bad enough. Like, how can I be expected to be responsible for social needs? And I just, I want to put out there that nobody anywhere is saying that providers should be responsible for this, that um, advanced practice clinical providers should be responsible for this. But a lot of people are saying healthcare teams can't ignore this. So it may be that not addressing patient social needs could be le leading to higher levels of burnout and the expensive consequences of burnout, like poor quality of care and provider turnout. So this is just a snapshot of one study that we did, a cross-sectional study exploring providers' perceptions of their health system's ability to meet their patient's social needs. We did this here in the San Francisco Bay Area with about 500 clinical providers, cl primary care clinicians actually, across three different health centers. We did this web and paper-based survey. This was from a few years ago already. And then we looked at how these different, um, your ability to address social needs, both your individual provider's ability to address social needs and your sense of your clinic's capacity to address social needs, how that affected provider burnout. We asked providers about, again, about their own personal capacity, but then uh, their perception of their clinic's ability to address social determinants. And I, I have a paper about this if anybody's interested in it. We can, I can share it with you. But lo and behold, the take-home message is that in adjusted models, we found that it was providers' perception of their clinic's ability to meet patient social needs that was the only significant predictor of burnout amongst the four social determinants items that we asked about. So both in this work and then in subsequent national work that we've done, where we ask similar questions of all family medicine physicians who are applying for recertification through the ABFM recertification process, we saw the exact same thing. And it wasn't isolated to providers working in the safety net. People know that social determinants matter and they know that their clinic systems can't ignore these issues. We actually subsequently conducted some qualitative work with providers, and it, I just love to close with this because it's so clear. So providers know that this is a critical issue. 
So I can do the best job in the world making the right diagnosis, do a perfect job of assigning the right therapy, and once the patient walks out the door, things fall apart. The impact of social determinants is clear, but moreover, the structural barriers that exist currently in our system that we are trying really hard to overcome are real. So this provider says, our whole medical system is set up in a way that makes it more difficult to take care of patients with bigger social needs. Because it's not like I'm getting paid any differently from Medicare to take care of somebody that's homeless with diabetes versus somebody that's diabetic and has a house. It makes it feel difficult. Oh, excuse me. It makes it difficult to feel supported from our healthcare system. So all this to say that there are many opportunities for us to improve the capacity of our clinical delivery systems to take on social determinants and then also to demonstrate the potential impacts not only on our patients but also on ourselves and the satisfaction of care that we in our satisfaction with the care that we're providing. I want to end with one major caveat to all the slides I've shown so far. So even though we know that integrated care is important, and we think that our healthcare teams should be addressing it, and there's lots of experimentation in this field, um, there are very few systems that are actually basing what they do on concrete evidence in this field. When we try to find information about what interventions actually work to decrease costs, improve health for patients with health-related social needs, it's pretty clear that the evidence lags behind the experimentation curve. We definitely need more evidence about the most effective and sustainable ways that the healthcare system can get involved in this, which is why I work for SIREN, which is this Research Translation Acceleration Institute, where really our mission is to catalyze and disseminate high quality evidence to get it into the hands of people who are going to do something about it. Um, and I'm really hopeful that this will serve as a resource to those of you who are here in Santa Cruz and Monterey and Merced counties who have the potential to do an enormous amount about your patient's social determinants. So we have an evidence library. We have all sorts of uh, resources and other tools, including all the screening tools I mentioned during today's presentation, available. The site is totally free for everybody to use. Please use it to the extent that it could be helpful. So that is my whole presentation. Um, I'm really looking forward to the panel discussion tonight and the discussion that follows that. Thanks so much. Am I on? The You're on. Okay, great. So that was inspiring to me. That was a lot. A couple of the slides weren't there, and we'll, we can remedy that. And for those of you who are listening, I neglect to say, who are listening in your homes, you will be able to submit your questions in, a, in the chat box that's in the, in the right side bar. Um, and those of you here in the room, you get to do it live. Um, so we're going to start now with our panel, and we're going to start with Joni, who is, uh, I think, in San Francisco. And we have your slides up, Joni, and I think you can start. In just a second, we'll confirm that we can hear you. Great. Can you hear me? Hi. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. OK, great. Thanks. Well, it's, um, it's really wonderful to be joining you tonight, and I really appreciate the chance to talk about our program at San Francisco General which actually um, began as a program um, with Laura Gottlieb, who just spoke. So you can move on to the next slide. Um, our program is called the ZSFD Health Advocates Program, and it began as a large-scale evaluation um, of two health navigator programs, one at our hospital and one at Children's Hospital Oakland. It was an 18-month, 1,800-family randomized control uh, trialed, and the goal was to address low intensity social needs by connecting families to community government and hospital resources. Um, so you can move to the next slide. So basically both at Children's Hospital Oakland and at San Francisco General, we randomized control and intervention days for families. On control days, patients would be screened for social needs needs would be identified, and then a volunteer health advocate would provide a list of written resources that the patient could use to get assistance. On intervention days, the advocate would stay with the patient and help them get connected to the resources. So for instance, they would call to make an appointment with CalFresh. The intervention families also got ongoing case management for up to four months. 
Um, and the results showed that, yes, indeed, in-person assistance did lead to a larger decrease in social needs and larger improvements in parent reported child health. Um, so that was, you know, a very interesting finding that that spending time in person with families led the families to, to report that their children had better health. Um, so next slide, please. This is going to just talk a, go over a bit of some of the results that we found in terms of social needs. So you can see running out of food uh, was the highest. Utility bills uh, also very high, and it goes down from there. Um, the major finding was just the sheer prevalence of need. Um, we should add, though, that while many patients uh, identified needs, not everyone wants help with the needs that they identified. So that's just a caveat there. Um, next slide. So after the study ended, we were asked if the health advocates could continue their screening in, and in-person assistance in the Children's Health Center. Um, we found funds through some ongoing hospital grants and are now operating uh, in three outpatient clinics at the San, Fran at San Francisco General. So we're in the Children's Health Center, the Women's Health Center, and the Family Health Center. Um, we're not there full time. We're there in each of those clinics about 20 hours a week uh, in each of those clinics. Um, and we use uh, uh, student volunteers, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. Um, next slide. So I'm going to just talk briefly about the workflow. Um, so basically, a, a, the patient uh, visits the clinic, and once they are roomed, the volunteer goes into the room and asks if the patient would like help connecting with uh, so, uh, resources in the community. And so we, we try to present it like, you know, we ask these questions of everyone. We are here to help, you know, families get connected. Can we ask you some questions? If the patient says yes, the volunteer will then conduct the social needs screening. And I can, uh, I'll talk about specifically the items we ask about. Um, once they've identified their needs, the volunteer then asks if they can identify two prior priority needs for uh, assistance that they can kind of get working on together that day. Um, and then the volunteer helps with resource connections with a real emphasis on warm handoffs. So being able to, to take it to the next step of getting that patient connected uh, to care for their need. Um, it is a tiered re uh, resource uh, and referral system. So more complex uh, issues are referred to social work or legal aid. Um, and then our volunteers do do phone follow-up every one to two weeks for up to six weeks. Um, so next slide, please. So these are currently the issues that we screen for, and they were picked both based on kind of social determinants of health data and on questions and areas that we felt that college age volunteers, which are most of our volunteers, had a capacity to ask about. So we don't ask about mental health. We don't ask about IPV. Um, if if those things come up in a screening, um, our volunteers know that they should um, get their supervisor. We always have a paid supervisor on staff in the clinic with them or the provider or the social worker. Um, so this is currently our screening, uh, the, our areas of screening. Next slide. Um, so next slide after this, I'm just going to talk briefly about the algorithms that our volunteers use to guide them. So our volunteers do go through a pretty extensive training before they are on the clinic floor. Um, but we have about a 20 page uh, algorithm booklet. Um, and so for instance, food insecurity. So if the volunteer identifies that the family needs food today, these are the, the resources they should start with and these are the, the steps they should use. If the issue is not that they're out of food today, but they run out of food at the end of the month, then they follow um, the protocols on the other side of the sheet. Uh, next slide. So this is just another example eviction concerns. Um, all of these algorithms, everything that we do uh, is on our website and they're all up there for anyone to use and modify in their own area. Um, the website is at the end of the presentation. It's healthadvocates.ucsf.edu. Um, next slide, please. So we use um, ECW and uh, our volunteers track what they're doing in a in a database called REDCap, but their notes, uh, the supervisor will then enter into the uh, electronic medical medical record as a telephone encounter. So when a, a family is it begins getting uh, help from the health advocates, and when the case is closed, the supervisor puts a, a, a telephone encounter into ECW so that the providers at least have some idea about the issues that the family uh, or patient is getting help with. Next slide. 
So I know, you know, many of you may be interested in starting a program um, similar to this. And so I wanted to just talk about some of the challenges that we faced both initially um, and ongoing. So some of the initial challenges that we've dealt with, um, you know, ad addressing workflow concerns. So our volunteers do screen during downtime. We are a, a, a teaching hospital, so there is a fair amount of downtime in the room. So once a patient is roomed, the volunteers will knock on the door and then go in. If the provider comes in, the volunteer knows to step outside um, and then can enter again if the, you know, if the if the resident is going to speak to the attending or if they're, you know, running uh, a lab or something like that. Um, if the patients are too sick to be seen, there are special rooms where the nurses know that they can put patients and we don't screen in those rooms. So if there's, you know, a, a, a mother with a child who's vomiting and, you know, clearly it's not someone we should be bothering at the moment, they will be in a room that we don't screen in. Um, and, you know, we don't want to add to the provider um, workload. So we do have a supervisor on site. We have the algorithms that we, um, we really ha have the volunteers follow closely. Um, you know, obviously, if a, if a provider wants to grab a health advocate and say, oh, I've got a patient, I'd love for you to talk to them, that's great. But we do try to kind of stay um, out of the way of the providers in terms of making sure that their workflow can, can happen. Um, next slide, please. So we have been a, a program since the study ended for about three years, and there are still some ongoing challenges for our program. We are still kind of a separate grant funded program that that works in clinics, but we don't really have an institutional home within pediatrics or within OBGYN. Um, so we're still slightly siloed. Um, we are still grant funded, so we're not uh, yet in the operational dollars of the hospital. And so it does make some long term planning difficult. Um, you know, there are some great uh, uh, other folks that are in the clinic that do some, some sort of similar work. We've got behavioral health assistants and things like that, but we have to be very careful that we're not um, asking any of those folks to supervise our volunteers because there are union con contracts and job descriptions that are already in place. So we just have to be aware of that. Um, and space is always an issue for us. I mean, we are kind of a roaming crew. We don't have a secured fixed help desk space uh, where providers can send patients. Next slide. Um, I just want to briefly kind of review the volunteer training. Um, so all of our volunteers are onboarded through San Francisco General's volunteer office. So we are not keeping track of their immunizations or anything like that. So once they're onboarded with the volunteer office, then we um, provide additional training before they're on the clinic floor. Um, so we provide training in these issues. So, you know, social determinants of health, cultural humility, privacy, the, the data platform we work on, REDCap, um, among other things. And it's really a great volunteer experience. Um, we do try to recruit from the community. About 75% of our volunteers are bilingual. Um, we, are, we, know we look for volunteers at local community colleges, at um, you know, various places, at community health worker training programs. Um, so we can really uh, have a volunteer um, base that reflects our community. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a, a quick overview of um, the population that we've served in the past. This is about 18, 19 months. So we approached and kind of asked 2,700 patients if they would like assistance. 69.5 um, of those said yes, they would be interested in having assistance and wanted to go through the screening with us. Um, of those, um, you can see um, the, the, the highest needs. And these are somewhat different than we found in the study. Um, and that's, you know, par uh, partially because we're also in different clinics now that the study was just in the Children's Health Center. We're now in the Women's Health Center. So child care is a really big one. Um, you know, and just a, a different ways of asking the questions. Um, so next slide. So what's next for us at San Francisco General? Well, we are transitioning to EPIC. Uh, this coming August, and there is a social determinants of health module that will be incorporated into the electronic health uh, record. It's not going to be mandatory, um, but it will uh, have uh, fields for all of the following items. So things that, you know, some that we're already screening on, some that the behavioral health teams are currently screening on, um, and it is kind of yet to be decided who's going to be doing this sort of screening, who's going to be entering this in the electronic health record. So that's all for us to kind of figure out over the next few months. Um, next slide, please. 
So really, you know, what we want to do is kind of share our learnings from the past three years and um, how do we leverage that knowledge into the, kind of what's happening next in San Francisco? How could we use this to screen for and address social determinants of health throughout the San Francisco Health Network? Um, can we, you know, can we incorporate volunteers somehow under behind primary care behavioral health staff and become more integrated into the clinic? Um, so those are just some of the things that we're um, thinking about and working on for the future. Um, next slide, please. So here again is the website um, and you can see our algorithms and um, the, refer the uh, resource sheets that we give to all patients, whether or not they say they're interested in screening. Um, and I've got other training materials and things like that that I'm happy to share and there's my email. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Joni, that was great. Um, and think about your questions for Joni. And then now we get to have our next speaker. So we have Jared calling to us, I think from Guerneville, yes? From Guerneville, California. So I'm Jared, I'm very happy to be here. I'm a family doctor at an FQHC in Guerneville, which if you haven't been to is a small rural community um, in North Bay. And uh, I'm also the medical director for our homeless services program, which we've been putting together for the last three years or so. And so my hope is uh, to show how in a non-research institution, how this is a very, this is very doable work and some of the lessons that we learn doing that. Next slide. Yeah, so lessons learned through happenstance and necessity. So I'll tell you a little bit about our story of building our program. Next. I went to school a bunch like we all did and homelessness is not highly profitable so I have nothing to disclose. Next. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was lucky, let's pause on this. Um, I was lucky enough to be in Sonoma County and at West County Health Centers which was already focusing on social determinants of health for quite a while. Uh, the county published this portrait of Sonoma County which is a base, based on uh, census data and brought a lot of attention to Guerneville as a very underserved area. This prompted my health center to start a social determinants of health work group, which inevitably led to this survey, um, which I believe we've included as a handout today. And you're welcome to steal from this. It's like a coalition. Yes, it's part of the packet. Thanks, Jared. Yeah, so you're welcome to look at that. That's what we're using for our screening tool. And it's produced a lot of data, including this rather unfortunate heat map of opioid prescribing. And that really red area is downtown Guerneville, where I'm sitting right now. Next slide. So using some of this data, we were able to get a 330H grant that provides um, specific funding to provide primary care for people experiencing homelessness and that allowed us to start our program. Next slide. And so we got to start doing the fun work, which was sitting down and putting together all of everyone's knowledge about social determinants of health and trying to get a team-based model together. Um, let's do the next two. We hired a uh, program manager and also a nurse, and we're off to a good start. And then, next slide, please. And then this happened. Our health center burned to the ground. Um, and so this was in 2015 on Christmas night. And it left us without a place to work out of to launch this program. Um, so you can imagine lots of logistic challenges, but also forced us onto the street where our clients actually were and out of the office. And out of that, we ended up with a much different model than we probably would have had otherwise. Next slide. And nonetheless, we've had great program success. So we now have um, a patient navigator slash access coordinator, um, a like, front office administrative person, a licensed clinical social worker, um, a medical assistant, uh, our program manager, myself as medical director, and a care team nurse, all working together for about 250 clients is about the census that we keep, um, doing a whole bunch of services, psychiatry, addiction services, on lots of system navigation and therapy. So things that we've learned along the way. Go ahead and advance, yeah. Leave the clinic. Um, the, our administration was very nervous about this idea, which we wanted to do from the beginning. 
Uh, but then losing our building made this something we couldn't not do. And so doing self determinants work makes it, um, it's much easier to know what you're doing and what you want to do if you're able to leave the clinic, interact with your community partners, learn the resources yourself, send staff on field trips, and see what's going on in people's lives outside the clinic. Next slide. It takes a team. I think we've seen this again and again in the two speakers thus far, that this is not work um, that one person should take on. You need lots of different skill sets and lots of different people's time to address this. Next slide. Yeah, adjust the model, not the services. So I'm proud of the care that we give everyone at our health center. And the problem wasn't the services that we had available. We already had behavioral health. We had psychiatry. We had great primary care. The problem was the model that if you come in and want, or one of my housed regular patients and want to get a visit with me, it's three or four weeks till I have my next appointment. And if you don't know where you're sleeping tonight, that's just not going to happen. And so we uh, spent a lot of time thinking about how to change the model of people accessing care and focusing on immediacy so that people could get their needs met when they identified them to us, um, rather than having to develop lots of new services. Next slide. Yeah, provider time is not the answer. I think Dr. Gottlieb uh, summarized this well also. Um, I, I think that getting into this work, the providers are very nervous and the administration is very nervous about how much provi expensive provider time this is going to take. And if you build a team around yourself and invest in empowering your medical assistants and your front office and your nurses, lots of other people can do this work and honestly probably do it better than the providers who are not particularly trained in a lot of this. Next. Yeah, bill creatively and legally. Um, it, so we were also, I got a lot of pushback initially about billing outside the four walls of the clinic, which actually can be done. If your clinic is already doing home visits, this is a way that you can bill for some of this work if you leave the clinic. And that's very much worth doing. Um, I'm happy to talk to people offline about what we've done and how that's worked out and how we've helped our administration feel more comfortable with that. Next. Yeah, don't take it all on. Um, we're lucky to have some great community partners who work with us on housing and other services. And this is super important because it's, it's a lot and you can't do it all on your own. Um, and once you start doing this work and putting yourself out there as an interested partner, it's been amazing to me all of the partners that I didn't know or potential partners that I didn't even know existed that came out of the woodwork and wanted to form formal partnerships. Next. Trauma is real. Next slide. Um, this is for a oh, slide before that, please. <laughs> Back. Um, there we go. So both for the patients and for the staff, and I think that's really important. So having a framework to understand some of the behaviors you see is really critical for staff well-being. Uh, so we talk a lot about the intersection of ACEs and trauma and mental illness and addiction and why some of the people we serve are not grateful and pleasant and easy to be around and why that's okay. And talking about traumatic brain injury and appropriate treatment for personality disorders and the effects of institutionalization. So important to be cultivating uh, community or rather institutional expertise about that. Next slide. And then taking care of your staff. This is Armstrong Woods, which is luckily for us, five minutes from our clinic. Um, and we make an effort to get out there quarterly and spend some time together. But whatever, whatever feels good for your staff, if you're asking them to take on what is potentially traumatizing work, to make sure that you also carve out some space for wellness and to make sure this is something that can be enriching for them rather than depleting. Next slide. Yeah, dive in now. Um, I think that when we think about these projects, it can be really intimidating and it can die in committee. It can be a lot of meetings without actually turning into action. And I would really encourage people considering it to just start doing this in some capacity right away and the path will show itself. Next slide. I feel free to reach out to myself or my program manager who can give you more details about what we've been doing. Thank you.
That was beautiful. Thank you, Jared, so much. And thank you to your program manager as well, to Jed. Incredible work. Thank you so much. So I'm sure we'll have questions for you. And now we get to hear from Wendy. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay, terrific. Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy to be here and what wonderful speakers. Thank you to all of you. What's really cool is that I'm hearing the same messages over and over and over and, and learning that we've all had very similar um, lessons learned. So for any of you that have not started um, a social determinants program yet, this is kind of neat. I mean, that, so you're going to hear some stuff that, that's fairly repetitive, but good lessons to learn. Um, we can go to the next slide. I'm with Neighborhood Healthcare. We're in uh, San Diego in Riverside County. We've got 13 integrated behavioral health clinics in our primary care settings. Uh, we serve low income, medically underserved, uninsured individuals. We serve approximately uh, 65,000 unique patients a year, about 290,000 visits. Um, uh, uh, only about 5%, but it's still a very significant amount of our patients are homeless or indigent. They have very complex needs. Um, the majority of our patients are, are Medi-Cal or they'll be self-pay if they're undocumented uh, individuals. And then about 5% of our uh, patients are dual diagnosis. We use uh, ECW, which is eClinical Works for our um, electronic medical record. Can go to the next slide. So, thank you. So, um, I, I used a picture of a beach, really more or less to use as an analogy, because when we thought about doing this, again, social determinants and knowing that our, our patient population suffers from this is nothing new to any of us. We've known it for a really long time. Um, but really as an FQHC with limited resources, we had to ask ourselves, you know, do we focus the efforts on all the shells on the beach and cast a wide net to, you know, try to help most people we possibly can, or do we focus our limited resources on the complex needs, like, you know, in this particular picture of that, of that starfish, for example. So the realities we had to acknowledge um, that really got in the way, to be honest with you, but they are realities nonetheless. We need to acknowledge them. But it, it um, they served as barriers for us to think we couldn't move forward anyway. But the realities of our FQHC were that the, the social determinant needs in our vulnerable population, they can be very complex and diverse. Um, about 40% of our population is also monolingual. We have a huge amount of folks that are, are illiterate and, and that certainly adds uh, to the complexity of us providing any referrals. When we started to think about assessment, navigation, and tracking social determinants, that's very costly um, with a lot of resources we don't have. And a lot of things that, that we were concerned about, the, the time involved with it um, and everything not being billable. Um, FQHCs typically lack resources to fund this much needed service. And sometimes the services, you know, again, what we're thinking about aren't available. So honestly, there, there was a, um, the reality of all these barriers um, really led us to some sort of moral distress, to be honest with you, where our providers and staff didn't want to ask questions that we didn't have resources for. And at the time we started this, there really wasn't anyone that had time to even research and look at, you know, what are the resources that are out there and available? Um, so initially we started super small and we just had a little prescription pad um, that was for food insecurity and basically asked somebody if they had food insecurity and then referred them to call 211 in their area. Again, not the best solution, but it was a step. It was just a baby step and a, a small start of something we could do. Next slide. So once we got to the place where we said, okay, we, you know, we get, we get the challenges, but we, we want to do this anyway. Um, my leadership essentially came to me and, and, and said, okay, we want you to create a program that doesn't negatively impact staffing, not going to impact our patient flow, and it's going to positively impact the, the essential resource needs that we have for, you know, all these shells on the beach in our analogy. And so I started to think about what steps do we need to, to take to be able to meet that challenge. Um, one of the things, knowing our population, we had to identify a tool that was easy to use and understandable. Um, we had to be able to embed that tool in our process that already existed so that we're not adding time to anything that anyone's doing. We also knew we needed to take a step back and identify what community resource existed out there. We really didn't know. I mean, we had like our, our, our you know, two or three go-to places, but, you know, we really needed to know what the resources were before we decided what questions we were going to ask. Um, so staff didn't feel stressed out when they asked those questions. Um, and so slowly we started looking on the internet and calling around and getting to know our community. 
we developed a community resource guide for ourselves. Um, and then from that, um, we decided what questions we were going to ask. We also realized that, you know, it, I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Godlin um, said it earlier, you know, if you don't document it, it didn't happen. We wanted to make sure that we give a voice to our patients and our population. So it was very important to us from the beginning, before we started this, we have got to document the data. If not, you know, if for nothing else, even just to utilize as a needs assessment to un better understand our population. So part of when we started this, um, we wanted to use this data to build also for business case models, for um, writing grants, things like that. But we worked with our, our data analysts to do a very simple, if you know ECW, we just created a simple structured note um, in the EMR. So it's documented not only in the patient's medical record, but all that data every night is also aggregated um, to a large database that we're able to see every single day. We can, we can see what our needs assessment is um, for our entire population, and then we can we can splice that up into different areas of San Diego County or by age or whatever it is we want. You can go to the next one. So part, part of our biggest challenge that we had to get over was also challenging our thinking because we didn't want perfection to get in the way of us trying something new in order to do good. So after we determined you know, what resources existed in the area, then we had to research screening tools um, that met our needs. And we ended up landing on health leads. Health Leads is, um, they have a toolkit and all this is free and online um, that they have all these different questions that are validated that you can choose from to create basically your own social determinant, either program or questions that you want to ask. And then each of the questions, they, they rewrite the question in a way that um, if you are looking for a fourth grade education level or it can be written at a ninth grade education level or even pictures. Um, so that really appealed to us with our particular population that we had. And we chose the 11 questions below based on the um, uh, community resources that were available in our area. And um, we really liked Health Leads for us. It allowed us some flexibility to design our program um, for our population. And, um, and these questions match the resources we had. Go to the next one. What we did was we, we have our um, our questions, what we did is we embedded them in the intake that already exists. So when we have patients come in, they have to fill out the regular intake pa paperwork, and that includes like the PHQ-9, the DAS, the audit. So we included these 11 questions. This literally adds less than one minute to the process. And that includes, you know, our particular process, our care team might have an MA that enters in those other screening tools. And to enter yes, no to these 11 questions, literally was nothing, less than 30 seconds for them to enter it. So we, we wanted to just start with this. Um, and any positive response to any of these 11 questions, that resource guide that we developed, we essentially hand a patient a resource guide and they're expected to self-navigate. Now, we want to acknowledge right up front, this is not um, the greatest, best process um, for everyone because we also know that we're going to have those patients that do have very high complex needs and may not be able to self-navigate on their own. It's very complicated, but this is a starting point. So again, don't get stuck on perfection. You can still do a lot of good, even if it's a needs assessment, you can still do a ton of good by providing as many people as possible with resources they may not have known existed. So this way really was our first touch and we called it Low Touch Social Determinants of Health Program. We only implemented this on 4.1 and already to date, we've done almost 24,000 assessments. So that's huge. I mean, so what I wanna show you is we did that without any additional resources. It hasn't interrupted our patient flow and we have all this rich data now that we can use. Additionally, when I'm able to kind of filter it down for purposes of this talk, I didn't do it, we don't have enough time, but when I filter it down by, you know, uh, East County, San Diego, where I have a large Arabic um, refugee population, different from my North County, San Diego, largely Hispanic, different from my uh, Riverside community that's more rural in nature, nature and, and these um, social, I mean, uh, community resources don't exist. You know, th this, this graph is gonna look very different um, depending on how I splice it, but it also lets me know really clearly where I need to reach out to community resources and build those partnerships. Um, based on what the information that our patients are sharing with us. You go to the next slide. Okay, so um, lessons learned. We have learned so much from this process. And a lot of this is very similar to what um, other folks were saying. Um, basically, a number one thing we had to challenge initially is our thinking that was focused on barriers instead of solutions. 
that can stop you dead in the water every time. If all you're thinking is this is overwhelmed, we can't do anything, it costs much. You know, I even heard comments like, you know, is this really our problem anyway? Uh, we're an FQ, we do medical and behavioral health. Isn't that um, whole person care? And I want to strongly tell you, no, it's not, obviously. <laughs> so if we don't address social determinants, we will have a very limited impact on uh, medical and uh, behavioral health needs. And I wanna also suggest it is all of our problem um, to address this. If we truly wanna live behind our missions and values and uh, change our communities. So um, for one of the first things we had to do is we needed to paint a picture of what could be done to overcome the obstacles, these thinking obstacles, and just to instill hope. We needed to believe and focus on, well, what is possible? You know, and what is not? What is it we can do? So some of what we had to do is decide to think outside the box. So if our patients can't get a resource, for example, we have patients with tons of transportation issues. Um, we, we bring resources in. So once a week, I have extra office space or an exam room that's available. I'll bring in access to independence and I'll schedule patients for them who might help them fill out um, housing forms or benefit forms, social security forms. Um, so that's just a suggestion. If you don't have the staff, utilize volunteers. We've heard other speakers talk about that. Um, the other thing I want to strongly encourage you, look at the staff that you have. There, there is just no price that you can put on um, staff that have passion and care and their desire to be a part of a solution. When we started this, I started this really small individually with one person and I just fit it into their job in the regular eight hours, no extra overtime. And then other staff, once they started seeing the stories that were coming from this and the patients that were helped, they said, could you cross train me? Could I do that? Could I start to interview people? And it just grew um, until we created a, an organization wide low touch process. Um, you know, again, if you don't have space for things like that, consider teledetermines. There are a boatload of grants out there right now that are trying to encourage us to use more technology and things and uh, will enable you to buy telehealth carts. Um, if you don't, you know, the, the other way that we started this too, consider mini grants. If you're not a grant writer, or you don't have a director of grants or somebody to do that, mini grants are great. They're usually about four pages long and you you, you know, you might be able to get 25,000 or 50,000. It's something small enough that might, you know, pay that part-time person to start something. Um, the other thing that we were really clear from the beginning, we don't want to become a social service agency. That is not our goal, but we also look at if our mission is to um, improve the health of our communities, we need to partner with our experts. And so we now have wonderful partnerships with a lot of our community-based organizations. And the other thing is I really want to encourage you, don't just look on the internet on, on your community-based organizations that are available, go out to their programs, tour them, orient yourself to them, shake hands with somebody and make eye contact so you're building a relationship. That way when you refer a patient, that patient is going to get that need met versus you just kind of giving that cold referral um, to someone. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, change, even desired change is very difficult. Um, just like Dr. Garrison was talking about, you know, these aren't the easiest patients to work with. Be compassionate. When your patient doesn't follow through with needed resources and all that work you did for them, I cannot tell you the number of patients we've had that have said, thank you for not giving up on me, even when I gave up on you. It happens all the time. We capture stories all the time so people can really get to know and, and you know, uh, humanize our patients. Um, again, identify those barriers and remove them. We do this proactively. We ask somebody, after I've identified all these uh, resources for you, let me figure out all the reasons you're not gonna get there and you're not gonna follow through with that, with getting there. And then we try to, I, you know, get transportation vou vouchers. We try to arrange daycare. Um, if they have language or literacy issues, we try to identify an advocate to go with them. Um, the other thing, again, you know, how, how um, uh, Dr. Garrison ended his talk, please take care of yourself. This work is very difficult. It can be emotionally draining. It can burn you out. Oddly enough, a lot of our providers, uh, like what was said earlier, they were getting burnt out for knowing these issues existed, but weren't able to address them. Um, same thing can happen if you are feeling personally responsible to address all these needs with your patients. So please maintain good boundaries. Try to have balance in your life as much as you can so that you can provide the best care uh, to those you serve. And remember that you're not alone. You're, you're part of a huge team. Let me go to the next one. So the next slide real quick. So what about that starfish? I mean, this is great that we can do low touch for as many people as we can and we can touch them. And for those that are high functioning enough, giving them a list of community referrals is great. They will be able to self-navigate. But boy, we all have those starfish. Those are those folks that have very complex needs that prohibit them from effectively self-navigating. And I listed kind of, you know, just a 
minor amount of difficulties, but believe it or not, everything I have in that starfish is pretty common to a lot of our folks that have very complex needs. So the other thing we had to think about with our limited resources, well, how do we target high touch navigation for the 2% of patients that are really this complex? Um, so again, think about providing that within the existing job duties that you have. That's how I started this process. So now we actually have a high touch program as well. Um, we will spend time um, fully assessing um, someone's needs. We make appointments for them. We follow through and track them through their EMR. We use mini grants for this, and now we're using volunteers to do a lot of this work. Next slide. So this is just what I wanna leave, leave you with. So please, if you can, don't get lost in, in, in the barriers or the, or the mountains, you know, uh, focus on what's important. Don't get lost with all the things you're not able to do. Start very small. Remember, we started out with that prescription pad that just said call 211. Better than nothing. It's a start. Um, figure out where you can start and make a small difference, one starfish at a time. And I'll just leave that poem for you to read yourself in the interest of time. If you have any questions, please contact me. Happy to share any information. Right. right. So this is our time. We have um, our folks that are listening from the internet, and Brian, you're going to tell me if someone has a question. Mm -hmm. Our live audience, what might you do, and where are all the places you're from? What your bus be a or a thought, or for reflection. Yes, thank you. I think one of the things that I have noticed in practice is, I mean, I'm fairly new to the nursing area, so not knowing what the community resources are is the biggest challenge, because where do I begin? And, and a lot of the providers that I have seen that are working currently, my colleagues, a lot of them are not from nursing area. So how do we even get access right. to some of these resources to connect patients? So if I can summarize, you're saying you're new to the area, you don't know the resources. I don't, I mean, I have some thoughts, but do uh, any of our panelists want to make suggestions about how a provider whose organization doesn't have a book? We don't have resources? community resource books for uh -huh. uh, And where do you work? Golden Valley. Golden Valley. So you're a big FQHC. So, and, yeah. so we have a solution for that. So I'm Dean White at Nurse at Hospital, okay. so manager of care coordination, and we produce 10,000 brochures a year that are the community resource list. So you could give that to yeah. Golden Valley. Yeah. If you want to reach out to them, thank you. We have the solution right in the room. Well, we're and currently down. updating it. And you're currently updating it. Okay, so our panelists, you don't have to answer. Jennifer Marcus might want to say something to you. Sure, yes. yeah, and just a reminder that um, if you're working with these people who are Alliance members, we have a resource internally uh, for you to make referrals to our, our management department. And I can get you some, uh, that telephone number before you leave today. So. so do you have staff meetings at Golden Valley? Mm -hmm. So I could you guys go to a staff meeting and present your brochure and maybe Meeting yeah, of the Alliance to tell new providers maybe who don't know about the care management program. Because sure. I agree with what Wendy just said, like the eye to eye, the meeting in person, mm -hmm. as opposed to an email that comes flashes through your already way too busy box where it doesn't really land. So I hope that will happen. So if people are listening, the case managers at Golden Valley have those brochures. Okay, great. Okay. Again, you, like, you know, well, like the panelists said, I, I agree. I, I've been in hospital environment for 28 years now, and again, I, I'm always the optimist and always trying to build relationships and, and going out and you have to have one-on-one -on -one connections and taking one step at a time to improve that. It's hard because it's, it's easy to fall back into because in the in this the last hour I'm thinking about the limitations that we have in the hospital setting or other settings with limited resources right. and how my team only has so much time and our focus is so I'm always trying to rephrase it 
so that it's a positive, how do you take the first step forward continuously as opposed to continued silos and just working in your own environment and looking at all the barriers. So it's a matter of just the state of reframing it, reaching out and building so that we can improve it. Thank you. Yeah. Even our um, so we're lucky to have uh, permission from our organization to use some of our internal staff to visit people um, in different inpatient settings, which includes jail. So we have an access coordinator who, you know, is relatively inexpensive time that we send to visit people when they're having jail stays and to visit people when they're having hospital stays. And it makes a huge difference in that patient's buy-in when they come back to the outpatient setting, because you're the person who visited them often when no one else did. And just by having a physical presence there, it really helps with the care coordination and translating some of the work that happens in the hospital with the hospital social work work into actual life when they get back out in the outpatient setting. So if there's any capacity for creative thinking around that, it's time well spent. Thank you, such a good point. And I don't know if any of this coordinators from Golden Valley have the time to go out. I know you have a huge patient population, but interesting. Any other? Yes? I would just add that, you know, there are jail medical staff that are uh, outstationed as well as behavioral health interventionists within the jail setting. So looking for opportunities to develop relationships with them is a mechanism, you know, for you to get referrals back. So what we hear a lot from um, jail medical staff is that people are released with prescriptions for medications that they don't go and fill them. So working together to kind of bridge that gap and continue that conversation so that the jail staff person can say, you know, Golden Valley's uh, care manager Sally is aware that you're going to be released. She's a resource to you, so you can go back to see her when you're discharged if you're having trouble getting your prescription. Those kinds of relationships, even just the words, you know, the, the name of a person that that person's worked with in the past, may be one of those opportunities where they feel like they haven't been given that one. Right. Um, Anyone else? Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's settings like this um, in a community that helps build some of those partnerships. Uh, years ago, I worked in a hospital setting, and um, it wasn't until I came to public health and actually got into the community visiting patients in their homes that I realized you know, um, all of those social determinants that make it possible for patients to either follow the, um, the medical treatment plan or not. And so sometimes it's collaborating with public health um, to actually make those home visits that make a big difference. So connecting hospital with the clinics and you know utilizing other systems to help you get that full picture right. of what's happening um, to that person in the community. So well said. And I, I don't want to <clears throat> Jen, 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 yeah. it looks like she wants to say something. Oh, oh yes. I, I think that's exactly right. And um you know connecting with the videos um, as was mentioned, is really important. We do try to refer to the nurse visiting programs. These things that we can't do with our small program, but we know that those resources exist. I mean, we're just trying to make those connections and then follow up to see that those connections were actually made. But we, we do try to kind of refer out um, to both hospital and community resources as much as we can. I have to say it was hard to hear. Yeah. Um, I think our our sound didn't. We couldn't hear you well, Joni. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I was just. Uh, that's all right. Okay. <laughs> I think Joni was stressing the importance of again connecting with the CBOs, the care base. Okay. okay. Thank you. Case. You were talking better than me. So we're actually close to our ending time. I just I don't want to. 
make you feel too self-conscious. But we have two students um, who are getting your PhD, yes, in public health. Great. And so I'm going to recommend that you connect with this person here um, who's in public health. Do you know each other already? I'm no longer. So I know oh. the community setting, but um, collaborate closely with public health. And there's at least one person here. Oh, there we go. Here are the Oh, I don't know. I just have to see, like, you, all of you have done this for so many years, and students who are here, I just really love that you attended today, and um, we're looking to you to help get that research uh, happening. So, so that's what was talking about. So, speaking of research, um, some of the data sets that you guys are accumulating are like really interesting research. I mean, as epi people, we use like SES to determine a lot of um, health outcomes, and there's like not any like really good um, data available that's showing like, all the social determinants. So, is there at any point you all are willing to share your data with students? Right, and how is the data that we capture here? Like, you know, we're both new to this stuff. We're both we both we're both coming here. Um, and we're interested in like different things, like I'm interested in housing, and Freddie's just interested in the change, yeah, and mental health. Well, again, I want to throw in, you know, our our new frontier, and this is nothing new, innovative, but in our emergency room, it's night and day inpatients versus the ED. And over the last two years, we've expanded the two. We have two ED navigators, and now we have a dedicated social worker, so we have ED and a case manager. What we find is a gap with the connection. We talk about, you know, uh, utilizing data collection to our benefit to to uh, incorporate the linkage here, and we're missing the ball still. Uh, we don't capture just those folks that uh, everyone that's homeless and we identify social determinants. Uh, Dignity Health as a system is expanding, and we keep having the same discussion but we've not had any traction mm -hmm. with a solid platform wow. and so we all acknowledge here's an opportunity we just don't have the the uh, clarity or the bandwidth for a simple questionnaire and simple direction we're just scratching the surface and so utilizing volunteers you know, I'll all up to speed for that so, Julia, do you want to say something in response? Yes, to that? Just, no, 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 not in response. But I just wanted to throw out a tool. Uh, the Commonwealth Fund, which is a um, healthcare policy think tank from the East Coast, um, just put out something today on uh, social determinants of health. But um, they put out actually a tool that I just want everybody, including our panelists, to be aware of. There's a new um, uh, social determinants of health ROI calculator. So return it's, on investment. Yes, it's a pretty geeky tool, but for those, um, it's, it's especially good for health plans and for like community health centers to show the ROI, the return on investment of certain interventions um, that you're that you're attempting. So if you know how much money you're spending on each of your patients, you can actually plug in numbers and be able to then make a business case to your CFO or to your CEO to invest in that particular intervention. So again, um, I'm going to share that information with uh, the Health Improvement Partnership and, then and can they can um, distribute it to them. Again, it's pretty geeky. You either have to know those numbers or grab your CFO or leadership to be able to provide some of those numbers. It's a really, really nice tool. I have not seen an R ROI calculator like this. So I want to do two things. One is I don't want to let what Jess was said like not comment, but I do want to close for those of who need to leave at 7.30. I had wanted to talk about these call to action questions. These are from Dr. Gottlieb. This is what she wants each of you who are attending this session to think about. What are you doing? And sort of jumping all the way, you know, from top, what's happening now to what what can you do to make things better? And also, I want to say for the, for the students and everyone in the room, our panelists have made themselves available to you if you want to email them with questions. I want to thank everyone for their time, and thank you for joining us. And we love your feedback. Everyone, please fill out the green form for your feedback to how this was for you. And for your credit, 
um, if you're not an MDPA or FNP, you have your own little form that's allowed. Thank you so very much. And thank you to our panelists who were live, Wendy, Jared, and Joni. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As people are filling out their form, I just really want to thank you for keeping your, for tracking this issue of social determinants and trying to figure out a way to collect data so that our PhD students can make the world better. I agree. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and please take some pie. Yeah. Please <laughs> take some pie. Either while you're filling out the form or on the way out. I just thought there was some like pumpkin pie and a fruit pie and like a Thank you.